Hello. So here we have a beautiful Toshiba. Yes, that Toshiba. <laughs> BW3112 Japanese typewriter. Featuring at least a thousand different kanji. Now, this one I shipped all the way from Japan via eBay. And it is currently in non-functional condition. So, I mean, this does something. Lifts the ribbon vibrator, though the ribbon doesn't seem to be uh, linked, and the character lifting mechanism here isn't lifting any characters. Uh, technically, in the listing, the this roller was rather positioned like this, or rather like this. Yeah, like this. So. I suppose it rotated all the way to this position. And as you can see, we have a whole row here in a troublesome state. And it turns out that it's up here. I mean, yeah, it's not like the machine was advertised as working, so it would be up to me to repair it. Um, but I guess. This gives me a nice ability to, number one, take photos, and also just demonstrate to you roughly how this machine is supposed to work and what it basically comprises of. So I guess one thing that stood out to me for this machine was just how nice and clean, well, some scuffs here and there, and of course that dirt, but yeah, typically these key inserts are rather uh, discolored. Well. Um, now, maybe they did actually change the implementation. Oh, calling them key inserts, well, paper inserts, that is, legends, for what character you will print when... Okay, this guy's probably supposed to be bent a lot f further forward. <laughs> um, yeah, when you're... when you press this striking mechanism. Um... So basically, what's supposed to happen is you press this key, it will lift one of these rows out, and then this hammer here. Oh, okay. I suppose it's supposed to, like, load up and then impart a uniform striking force, uh, but <laughs> fortunately it seems like that mechanism might be broken. <laughs> oh, now this guy's jammed. <laughs> oh dear. Um, but yeah, then this guy gets lifted up, and this character is stricken. So you'll notice that there are leaf springs retaining each of these slugs and that presses the slug into the ribbon. Now earlier models, I believe at least prior to the second series, so like for example there is likely a 1112 counterpart to this machine as well as a 2112 counterpart, which would have had black side panels. Um, so the first series, they would have used ink rollers or ink pads, while I believe the second series, that's when they introduced this here, a uh, ribbon mechanism. It seems to be carbon ribbon, and there's indeed a quite decent bit of it left, but it's probably snapped. <laughs> So I'll have to fix that. Um, but, yeah, fun stuff. Um, right now this carriage is still in the jammed position. I have no clue what the state of the escapement is. Like, I mean, this guy moves nice and smoothly. This guy doesn't. Um, this might be like a indexing mechanism. Okay, I guess you can tell how often each of these characters are used by how
how dark this is. And I'd say that's quite a lot of impressions for these. Just knock the tripod. Um, now, I don't know any Japanese, but maybe those of you who do could tell which of these kanji are common. But yeah, typically all of these paper inserts would end up looking uh, like a, basically like this color instead. But on this machine it's all still in pretty good shape and with minimal discoloration. Anyways, time to try fixing this machine. So generally one of the first things you want to do when fixing a typewriter is to get its sticky or gummy bits unstuck and moving smoothly. I personally use some liquid ranch penetrating oil. Um, it only leaves behind a dry lubricant containing PTFE and apparently some ceramic microparticles. Just applying it here and there until the motion gets smoother. I'd have to go under the machine. One good thing is that I was afraid that this might have been a fracture, but it seems like this is actually part of the original design. I'll have to investigate exactly how that's supposed to interface with this grabbing mechanism. Uh, and hopefully it shouldn't be too hard to reinstall this guy. Um, now surely <laughs> this didn't make its way from there to here during shipping, so maybe I just missed that this guy was sticking in there in the listings photos. So in this slot, we can now better see the innards of this barrel, which is really just pretty simple. So on either side, there is some kind of slotted wheel into which this thing should fit. And then you have a shaft in there. Of course, you can see the inside or the underside of all these rows. And I don't really see anything from the I have to look into what piece might be missing that's supposed to perform. Ah, I get it now. So, basically, normally this guy should be able to fit further down, though. Okay, actually that's pretty semi-ingenious and elegant. Because I was wondering, like, I thought that you would have an entire bar, like, running through the inside of the barrel, which is technically obviously impossible. <laughs> So instead you have a this grabber, and until I can resolve that jam, it should be able to fall down into that slot. And once it's in the slot, it will be able to grab on to this part here and lift up the slug. So imagine that this piece here, you rotate it over here, and the legends corresponding to these kanji will be situated uh, by a certain fixed offset. I still have to count. And once it's down here, it will be lifted up like this by this guy. And then it will be in front where you can strike it into the page. Might as well Stick it back in. Oops. And I have no clue if it's going to be able to... Oh, okay. Right. So... Yeah, I don't know how this guy came out. So I realize now that 
Yeah, it's supposed to fit within this slot here, or guide. Also, I had originally thought that this guy here was the carriage lease, but it turns out that it's rather this lever. And since that ratchet is still working, I'm pretty sure the escapement should still be alive. Just need to find out what's causing it to stick. So here we are at the underside of the machine. I still don't know what this guy does. Here's our mainspring, and as you can see, unfortunately rather well undone draw band. So this guy needs to be linked somewhere. Random piece of tape that was stuck here. Okay, so turns out that applying some liquid wrench to that particular pivot was what was key to getting the hammer striker all nice and smooth. Okay, so I serendipitously found that this guy here is actually a feature. <laughs> That's pretty cool. So that would allow you to lift out your characters, rows, and also insert new ones or whatever. Um, again, yeah, two slugs are missing here. But I should still be able to... Oh, right, I found that there was a lever... I forget which one... Okay, yeah, what I think now is that it's actually not this guy that is blocking so much as... If you look under here... There's a... Ratchet there. And I suppose there's supposed to be some lever here. That will lift that for you. Doesn't really. Okay, let's just go the long way. So, all the way to here. And with that, it should be possible to just insert this into the slot. Like so. Lift this guy, and drop it in. Perfect. And magically, the entire thing is now just moving smoothly. That's interesting. Uh, wait, what? Okay, well this guy's still stuck, but... Might have noticed how, as I press this key, the drum might shift left or right. That is due to the alignment tabs. And you can see those over here. So the Mignon typewriter, or Mignon, if you may, also has these, of course not as many, and they would also have a similar but radial 
version of these tabs to provide alignment about all the columns of the barrel. Well, the column on the big non, but that machine is currently in the shed, but you can look at this card if you want to learn more about the machine. Quickly bending this guy to be closer. Though, it seems like... It's a bit wobbly in this direction. And we also have a dent here. So I decided to unscrew this guy. Helps with getting a better view of what's going on in here. I'm not sure if these... I think they can. Yep. And a washer. That's nice and convenient. So this one was already loose. As for this guy, you have to get at that Phillips head. And there's another Phillips head under here. And this should just come off like this. Oh dear. Okay, there we go. Okay, so I haven't really been able to learn very much from here. Though I suppose I can go ahead and just access those surfaces and clean them. So something else, probably further back, maybe in the escapement or something, is jammed. Okay, so beforehand I thought I was encountering a situation where it needed the... oh goodness. Well, that sure worked. So I thought that this thing was spring-loaded, like you would press it and then it would shoot, but it seems like it's, in fact, operated just with... by how fast or hard you press this. It's nice that that works. Though that alignment seems pretty off. <laughs> check again. Oh, there you go. I see. Yeah, that's right. That's good. So I have to figure out what's up with this guy. It's not like this machine has a shift key. <laughs> uh, well. Oh no, it's alphabetical. <laughs> I would have had an absolute heyday if they put it in the Mignon's PFUGQ layout. <laughs> I have experience with that. Okay, so all I have to do is just pull it up. <laughs> um, at least before the hand, it seemed like there was a stronger force, but eventually I found it was just a basic springy force, and now it's good. So this guy is indeed the backspace, it's just that there was no... Oh, okay. Well, I guess something until now wasn't properly reset, so the backspace wasn't doing anything. That's good. And... Great. Escapement's alive. So, let's mainly figure out what this does and what this does. As for this interference, I was a bit concerned about how this guy might get pressed down during shipping, if not snap. Um, whereby I was hoping that the seller might unscrew that screw. I did provide a photo in the shipping instructions I sent them, which they technically did acknowledge, but I guess didn't really do anything other than just pack it or pad it well. Anyways, just bend it up <laughs> and we're all good. I have yet to figure out what this symbol means. Anyways, so... One, two, three. If you pull this out. Oh. Oh, wait a minute. 
Okay, so that's just your... That's your ratchet release. Single spaced, one and a half spaced. Ah, uh, of course, this is a space bar. Lovely. So basically, this machine takes advantage of the space bar being directly under the impression lever. I know of some other machines which do the same thing, like where basically um, an actual key press is simply an impression plus a spacebar actuation, and really all a spacebar is is just an instruction to your machine to act to advance the escapement by one step. And again, the escapement being the mechanism that allows the carriage to advance by discrete steps as you type. So I did a quick wipe down with some Q-tips, well, or cotton swabs. I forget if these ones were branded. Um, though that residue there doesn't seem like it's going away anytime soon without chemicals and whatnot. Perhaps it would be a good idea to first get this ribbon seated again. So it seems like Wait a minute. I sure hope it hasn't been creased for too far. Okay, it's not like... I'm going to assume that indeed the plastic end, or the back of the ribbon, the carbon ribbon, is on the outside. Given that, we need to... Carefully. Okay, seems like that might be part of the ribbon drive. It like pulls it or something. Yeah, there's like a spring here. This guy. Spring belt. Still need to look deeper into how that actually works. Well, currently, okay, so here. Okay, so you can see one of the poles there. And I suppose then that there's something at the other side that actually pushes and advances that. Okay, so I suppose... Yeah, these cranks are supposed to... or shafts are supposed to rotate in tandem. So currently... it is trying to... Well, now there's some spring resistance, I suppose. Yeah, it's attempting to rotate these together. So this would help pull the ribbon. Yeah, there I'm engaging the ratchet. Okay, so that's the back spacer. Okay, so it's a tooth or a rack kind of that engages in a special way to act directly on that spinning pinion. As for the actual... Yeah, I have yet to see any escape wheel or escape rack. Then we have this guy. I don't really know. this lever. Uh, 
we'll find out. So, what I've determined is that basically, assuming that this spool here, which appears to be the winding spool, has the back of the ribbon facing outward, so that goes into this roller, and indeed it is in fact fairly sensible that that knurled piece for applying pressure to this rubber puller would be contacting the back rather than the, um, well I guess it wouldn't really matter if it were contacting the already spent or typed on uh, carbon ribbon, but that's how they set it up. So that then twists in this direction, such that the back of the ribbon is facing that plastic roller. So that then goes up all the way to here, where as you can see, with a bit of awkward um, positioning, you are eventually able to fold this ribbon over this special ribbon guide, and then you're able to have the back of that ribbon visible and in position to make an imprint. That goes down. Now, yeah, this ribbon has some unfortunate creases. So now we have the back on this side and the, yeah, since I don't really, oh, okay, I'm not sure if the exact purpose of these tabs then, but I'm gonna attempt to use them like so and assume that you want the ribbon to be straight in these positions and to not have to twist. But yeah, in that case you have the, now it's the actual carbon side that is facing a roller, then you have a 90 degree twist, carbon side out, back inward, and into this spool where the carbon side is always outside. Okay, so let's go ahead and feed in some paper. The paper releases on this side. Carriage okay, release. Let's say I want to have the paper rest in that position. Oh. That guy basically tells you how to carry the machine. <laughs> Don't carry by the carriage, basically. Oops. Yeah, the feed rollers on these machines harden with age, and hence paper won't always feed perfectly. Not sure if I can straighten this ring out. Anyways, that should be good enough. So I pull that out, then I go back into the single spacing setting. Now to set the margins. Simply go to these guys, press and slide.
So the draw band isn't hooked up yet, whereby the sole purpose of this experiment is just to determine the appropriate alignment of this pointer here. So I would expect that kanji to be printed. And looks like it. Okay, so I figured to just unscrew this and remove this piece here so I could adjust it. I'm guessing that this bow here used to be straight, whereby what happened was somehow this guy got pulled outward and someone tried pushing it back, in turn moving this that way and also probably creating that dent. So, yeah, looking at some photos of these machines, indeed this particular bend was not supposed to be there. And then I'll have to undo that bend probably. So this here is about as good as I can get it. And I can see there's unfortunately some waviness here. Can't really fix that at the moment, but at least it's a nice curve. Starting upright and only bending forward as much as it needs to. Okay, so now we can see the profile. It's quite nice. And I've minimized the clearance. Now that sound that you're hearing, I'm pretty sure it's literally just the rattling of all the many slugs shifting around. Or it could rather be... I don't know. Maybe there's like something... A ratchet hall clacking. Anyways, so as you can see, once you press a key, it will automatically center like so, nice and perfectly under the character, and then we will produce an impression. Is that the same character? <laughs> Uh, let's try this one. Right. Oh, oops. Yeah, I jammed the space bar. Let's try that. Yep. That guy and that guy. Now, what I don't know is how many curse words are on this <laughs> uh, legend. <laughs> um, I don't know. It's like, if I were to type gibberish, I don't know what crazy incantations I might accidentally conjure. Mm, okay. Katakana and hiragana, except that I don't <laughs> know by heart which one is which. <laughs> um, I'm guessing these are really common characters. And then some other color coding that helps you navigate this. Um, okay, so if we do a basic count, 136. Okay, so off screen I quickly counted that each of these segments has 13 characters. So 13 times 36 is a total of about 1,404 slugs at most. Um, now, predecessors could have had upwards of like 2,500 or maybe even 4,000 for the large tray designs. Um, I'll include in the description a bunch of links um, for learning a bit more about the history of these machines. Um, but yeah, I guess 1,400 is a reasonable amount to know. Um, another thing is, yeah, so this guy this one allows you to insert custom slugs, so unfortunately I don't have any. And the corresponding legend would be here, or you would just know by heart the numbers. Um, so there's nothing here and nothing, or something there. Yeah, you can fit up to 
So if I were to just go ahead and remove this. Actually, uh, okay, I guess you technically can't use that spot since it needs to fit this guy here. Unless you were to mod it to actually fit it, but... Oh, well, okay, you don't actually have any leaf springs for this spot here. So this just makes it easier to use the same part that was machined for all these other rows. Then you just modify this side. Pretty smart design. So, yeah, insert characters. Okay, I'm gonna guess that, yeah, these ones you can't really remove without first removing one of these springs, which I'm gonna imagine isn't particularly hard to do. Like, I guess if you have a spike tool, which I do have one, you should be able to you know, lift this. Okay, now let's not accidentally impale myself. Okay, maybe there is a special tool, but yeah, you should be able to slide this spring out. And with that, remove these slugs. Now, one weird thing is that this guy here. So that's where they had some custom legends. I don't think they did that in any other part. Well, other than this row. Hmm. Okay, let's actually take a look at that. Okay, you know what? Yeah, before continuing, let's just go ahead and connect the draw band. Might as well. Okay, so for setting up the draw band, I recommend first putting the carriage all the way to the right, um, setting the left margin as far left as possible, and unwinding the draw band fully. So now it's at this position, and I've strung. Um, some 20 gauge wire. You can use whatever wire you have, or maybe an appropriate more straight tool, like something made of spring steel that's better at staying straight. Um, then you have to introduce it from this side here, not too far back and not on this side. Given that, your other end will end up here, which you can hook on, like so, to that knot. Then you, then you can carefully pull it. There we go. Then Once it's fully through, we'll want to make sure it gets seated onto that pulley there. You'll probably need to use the help of some tweezers. back. So here I did something to help maintain sufficient tension in order to keep that seated and with that you can carefully wind the draw band.
until we are comfortable with writing the machine again. Or ideally, we would actually first link this guy back. Honestly not sure where it's supposed to connect. Okay, so this draw band was an absolute pain to set up. Eventually you did find the place that you're supposed to link the draw band to. As you can see, there's a hook. That was a bit hard to find. Anyways, so given that, initially, while the machine was upright, I found that for this machine, you had to specifically push and push from this end here. Um, otherwise, just something about the angle would cause it to catch on this pole here. Um, and yeah, it was really finicky, like, basically, like at the start, if you wiggle it a bit, it might accidentally slip, whereby you'd have to start all over again. Um, so if you're careful and it's already in this state, then it eventually gets a lot more secure and you're able to tighten it. Now, an interesting thing is that it seems like there is a mechanism to prevent over-tightening. You can kind of hear that, like, shuffling. Yeah, so I believe it's a similar mechanism as used in some mechanical watches, and I guess, of course, mechanical clocks, where there's a special clutch mechanism that will slide if there's too much torque and that prevents you from accidentally snapping the mainspring. Like, in fact, earlier I did, um, because it wasn't catching the mainspring, and basically we would just be able to rotate the barrel indefinitely, I did actually unscrew this to investigate um, what was going on, and then eventually found that it actually could catch, so I didn't actually have to, like, disassemble the mainspring to check whether or not it had snapped. Um, whereby I just have to be really careful to make sure that I have the angles all good so that it won't slip. And yeah, here, on this end, you can roughly see the draw band connection there from that pulley. So even though the draw band is already at its maximum tension, still currently barely able to pull the carriage, so I need to get rid of those sources of resistance, um, whether or not it's in the carriage way or somewhere else. Something is sliding. Maybe it's that roller. Anyways, so... Yeah, here on this end. You can also see that pulley. And for the for smoothing out the side to side motion, I believe the primary source of the resistance is that bushing over there. That guy. So, I'll just apply some liquid wrench. So, as you can see, this roller is gummy. Apply a little bit of this. Okay. Now it rolls nicely. And likewise. We have ourselves reliable escapement actuation and carriage pulling. And that's with the draw band at its strongest state. And of course, you're not going to be typing that fast while operating this drum. <laughs>
Removing the rolls from this thing is quite satisfying. Anyways, I'm just doing this so I can give you this nice view, and also because I want to access some stuff. So do note that, yeah, this guy needs to be down if you were to move it. So, the original problem when I received this machine was that this guy was sticking up, and as a result, it behaved much like a ratchet. <laughs> can see, but it's supposed to sit down like this. Anyways, now you can see this lovely view. <laughs> Fun stuff. And yeah, I'm going to apply some liquid wrench to those pivots. And also, you can better see here how each of these pieces they sit on these slots and are held in place by this outer ring. And I guess maybe that that sound could be from pieces falling, like from this upper resting position, to falling and contacting that outer ring, mainly down here. Okay. That's just about half of them removed, and that's all I really intend on removing for the time being. Number one, I get to take this lovely picture. Wonderful guess a machine photo. And I'll be better able to clean this area and that area. Mm. Not really much over here, oh, except that we now have access to the top over there. And I can finally repair this dent here. Okay, so with the views afforded here, we will hopefully be better able to see what actually is going on with the escapement. So spacebar, so the right lever actually, like these crisscross, well, yeah, the right lever is what makes the impression. This guy, you still have to figure out its function, and that's your backspace lever, otherwise not much that you can actually see. From just there. Now on this end, you'll see that thing lifting up, and then that white roller on the right is only lifted by the impression key. Obviously, since I don't have anything that I'm lifting, there won't really be much resistance. I do still feel... Okay, yeah, that's just the indexing, like the alignment, the rotational alignment click that I'm feeling. Okay, otherwise, unfortunately, still can't really see much of the escapement. And over here, you can see how the act of pressing a key. Okay, so somewhere back behind there, when you try to make an impression, it pulls that link, which pulls this bail forward. And that leads us to that indexing thing that I'd showed a while back. This guy. Okay, well, yes, 
guess I'll start off in this position. Then we'll get pushed to index it. So I previously mistook this for a ratchet, which it obviously isn't. As for the impressions, so turns out that, yeah, that roller there is what is key to actually actuating the impression hammer. So it will hit that tab, which will then turn that bell crank, which then turns another bell crank over here, which finally, uh, another bell crank and another bell crank, and then you make an impression. I think I finally acquired a view of the escapement. So first, the spacebar. Would actuate that cam. Which I suppose eventually interacts. So there you see the ratcheting operation. Okay, so that, that thing with the two screws is stationary. So I suppose then that there's a rocker at the other end. But yeah, you could see that fundamentally it was a cam that was moving that rocker. Okay, so here you can kind of better see that ribbon advance now. So it's a pin and slot system. Okay, there's another roller down there. That rotates that larger rocker. So that's basically large cam. And its pivot is over there. That, so that's a plastic bushing that is being rocked back and forth. And that guy in turn goes in here. And do some mechanism, okay, you can kind of see it there. Basically just a bell crank. Well, here it's a class one lever first, and then that finally pushes that arm up, which lifts our row. Also, there's a the whole matter of the ribbon vibrator. So again, that lever, and basically, if you that guy. So the main lever has a pivot which finally rotates this class 2 lever. And that middle pivot there, that's the base of the ruined vibrator. You can also see how there's a cam over here. So there's that roller that operates a cam. Which in turn causes this guy to move backwards. So it's technically at this position at rest. Then that cam and roller pushes it back in turn actuating that link. And finally, that guy, which activates the centering mechanism. Here's another view of the escapement operation. You can see that cam, and then that rocker. And finally, we can see the floating dog. That little bronze-colored thing at the top. 
In fact, I'm not sure. That might actually be... Uh, I'm pretty sure it's just like a something that interacts directly with the tooth. Wait. Maybe there is in fact a star wheel. And here we have the whole impression mechanism. So the same... So from that same thin slot thing and the bale that lifts the character. I suppose there's a mechanism. Yeah, here it's only spring loaded. See from that same guy there's a rod that actuates that ribbon advance mechanism. So on the press it resets that further pawl. And then on the release it engages and advances. So that's from this lever. Okay, yeah. So that's for double spacing mechanism. Single space, double spaced. And here we have some more details for that view. And in the slot, yeah, the only important thing really is just that it, that guy moves up and down. And that somehow allows the escapement to advance either one or two teeth. 